digitaljamsessions.com. Welcome to this Digital Jam session. Today we are joined by Colin from Channel 4's Gaming Commission, or you are the, the, now the Games Commissioner for Channel 4, is that right, Colin? In, indeed, for my sins, yes. <laughs> uh, we have Will joining us from Fire Without Smoke, and we have James back from Kudan. Welcome back, James. And we also have with us this week Judith from... Where are we saying you're from this, this time, Judith? Before I say Girl Geek Dinners, where are you actually going to be from? Um, what are we talking about? <laughs> We're talking about the future of entertainment and devices. Then probably Girl Geek Dinners is fine. Okay, so Judith from Girl Geek Dinners. Thank you all for joining us. First of all, if I could ask each of you to introduce yourselves, explain a little bit more about where you're from and what you do, and then we'll dive into the conversation. So if we start with, with Colin, if you can explain a little bit more about what you do. Yeah, sure. So my, my my background is about twenty five years making making games in the in the games industry, mostly as a developer. So I've been up in in uh, Bonnie Dundee, as we call it, doing games like Grand Theft Auto and and Crackdown um, at the, the co-face of game development. And then for the last three years, I've gone over um, slightly to the, the the darker side of of publishing and commissioning, being Channel 4's games commissioner. And here I basically look across the, the slate of shows coming up for Channel 4 and I'll commission about half a dozen games a year to tie in with those. Um, so we've done games for the likes of The Snowman, The Hollyoaks, Stand Up to Cancer, Made in Chelsea, etc. I'm going to say truly you have gone to the dark side. And uh, Will, if you'd like to explain a, bit, a little bit more about what you do. Yeah, I am Executive Creative Director at Fire Without Smoke. We are an agency that set up probably about two years ago um, to work with marketing and advertising, creative and strategy for the games industry. So anything from Assassin's Creed, which we work with uh, with Ubisoft, to mobile titles. So we work with Space Ape and we work with a lot of UK mobile studios. Uh, me personally, I've been working in advertising now for about 22 years, since I was 17, a long, long time. You're making um, me feel old, Will. I, I already feel old. I have grey beard hairs now. I mean, it's just getting ridiculous. I have to pluck them out every day. Um <laughs> Uh, so I started in sort of coding and design and then moved up through that. So I've covered everything from telecommunications to fashion when I lived in Italy to banking and finance. Now, I do have to say that it wasn't my fault for the crash, although I do take some small part for making subprime credit cards. And in the, sort of the last 10 years, I've sort of specialized in movies and games, marketing and advertising and the creative side of things. So that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Wonderful. Thank you. And James, why don't you explain what about you, Dan? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kudan's been around for the last four years um, building mobile apps, um, but more importantly, augmented reality apps. So that's bringing um, content to life, whether that's in entertainment or marketing, um, more we're seeing in the retail environment and probably more growth in the kind of industrial and the B2B side. Um, but, But over those last four years, as well as uh, building apps uh, for clients. Uh, more recently, um, Cirque du Soleil and their sponsorship with, with DHL is, is quite an interesting one uh, for the entertainment uh, sector. Also doing a lot with, with various um, gaming uh, gaming companies. Um, but, but we've recently launched our own software. So we've been sort of developing that quietly in the background, using our own technology just to create our own apps. Um, we're now uh, launching that for um, game developers and mobile developers around the world to actually use our own technology to, to, to build out augmented reality apps. So that's that's kind of where we're at. And I, I'm responsible for helping um, develop solutions for our clients um, and our agency partners. Wonderful. Thank you. And Judith, why don't you explain to us uh, all about what you do? Well, as coordinator for Girl Geek Dinners, I'm involved in Um, bringing together women from all walks of life who are involved in a geeky pursuit, whether it is filmmaking or programming or marketing. Uh, My own background is online marketing, which I've been um, fortunate or unfortunate enough to have been involved in since 1996. I come from a programming (laughs) background, but I did study psychology at university. So I suppose you could say that um, I, I went from the light side of coding to the dark side of marketing and uh, now work as an online marketer. But London Girl Geek Dinners is all about bringing women together 
and having talks um, by inspirational speakers on really interesting subjects that run the gamut of all different pursuits and um, enabling them to network with each other so that they can find other women interested in the same things that they are. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Judith. I don't know when we all got so old. You've, you've all made me feel incredibly old now. Thank you so much. <laughs> so today's topic, we were going to talk about the very recent trend that I've seen emerging. And I don't know about the rest of you. Colin, you may be able to speak uh, more to this than, than necessarily some of the others in the, in the call. But one thing I have noticed very recently is there seems to be a real trend at the moment for game studios to to really be looking at licensing their content into film and TV. We've seen things like Assassin's Creed the film. And while on the other side of that coin, we're also seeing a lot of film studios and distributors making more and more inquiries about how to make games in a concurrent way alongside film development. And it feels that uh, the future of entertainment that we've been talking about for a while now, of this dissolving of lines and borders and uh, really a deviceless form of entertainment, uh, seems to be coming to the fore. So I'm curious to, to understand, Colin, from your experiences, whether you think this is the reality of the situation or not. Certainly from my conversations recently, I think that there has been more of a trend for people to begin to look at their franchises and their IPs as as very much not necessarily based around device or film first or game first, but more around IP or franchise first. What would you say to that? Um, I, I think it's definitely true. I think the, the, the only sort of proviso I would put on it is that I think most people are still thinking about particular platforms first. I think I think a game maker, um, you know, with Assassin's Creed, they, 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 they thought only about the game first and it was only because the game was a success that they started to look at Hollywood, um, and certainly with Hollywood, I think the the, the reverse is true. But it, it is really encouraging that we're seeing um, more crossover in in both ways, um, and I think really it's a it's a sign of the um, maturing of the the games market. Um, there's always been licensed games historically. I mean, probably up until GoldenEye in whatever that was ninety. Seven somewhere around then, um, you know, they, they'd historically been rubbish because they were purely just a, a, a quick um, cash cow um, f- for the movie studio to, to to make a little bit more. And it's only really been in relatively recent years that people have realised by putting a good content, they can get more than a quick buck um, at the very last minute, um, and. Certainly, from my point of view at, at Channel Four, it's 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 quite good to see that a lot of the broadcasters and TV companies and film companies are they're they're always looking for new ideas. They're they're, they're looking to see what's what's popular. Um, so when you have such phenomenal success with with so many games, um, you know the the Assassin's Creed, the the Grand Theft Autos, the Minecraft, the Angry Birds. Um, it's only natural that they're looking for, um, you know, to, to to build on those and and take them in a different direction for, you know, with the, the Hollywood angle. Um, so I, I think it's it, it's a good trend. Um, I think certainly as long as people continue to put effort into making great content, then it will go from strength to strength. Wonderful. So, Will, I suppose you've probably seen a little bit more of this than than some others because you're very much on the coal front with this. But I think for a a long time now, we've been saying that there's this kind of natural trend towards games becoming more cinematic in the way that they tell their stories. And I think you're very much on the front line of that with some of the trailers that you've been doing. And on the same kind of flip side of that, television and cinema trying to be more interactive with the way that they tell stories and the nature of uh, ARG campaigns or or integrated media campaigns. Uh, I'd I'd love to hear your thoughts or your experiences in that area. Yeah, I think over the years, I think, you you know, I think you're you're right. Basically what you've had happen is you've had your Super Mario movies and you've had your Street Fighter movies movies and your Tekken movies that were, but it was a very much a, 
oh, this is a big IP. Let's make something that's very, very similar on the cinema side of things. But what you've got now is you've got devices that will actually allow you to access every bit of entertainment content, whether that's a PS4, an Xbox One, a Wii, a mobile phone, a tablet, a smart TV. It doesn't particularly make any difference what the device is. You can now access both gaming and entertainment content from those devices. So it, it became a sort of a natural conclusion, I think, that gaming and entertainment and movies and TV would start to merge together because of the device that you're actually viewing it on. I mean, games are indeed trying to get a lot more cinematic. I mean, if you take The Last of Us as an example, I mean, that, that's over 200 awards that it won, not, not just for sort of the game itself, but for the narrative, for the story. I mean, it was incredibly cinematic to play. Um, you take sort of the Assassin's Creed, as was mentioned before, it, it became a franchise that was so beloved by fans, then it, the next step into making it into a movie seemed like an obvious sort of solution, whether that, you know, you make it into a movie, you make it into an app, you make it into a game, you make it into an extension of that franchise. <clears throat> I think it's always been the same. When you have a good, solid franchise with great content, opening it up to a lot of diverse people across a lot of different media was always the best way to go. And now that you can get all that media on individual devices, I think it makes great sense. <clears throat> you know, I can watch a movie on my PlayStation 4 and then I can flick straight into a game. Then I can pick up my tablet. I can have a second screen experience with both of those. Um, and, you know, it's it's a playing, it's just, it's sort of entertainment fun all around for everybody, really. I'm curious, James, we're, we're talking about this notion that actually, as, as Will says, entertainment can happen anywhere now. It can happen on any device at any time. And from your perspective with mobile development and the kind of advances that you've been playing with in terms of virtual reality and augmented reality, are you seeing any particular types of trends or behaviours emerging that really do kind of support this notion that actually nowadays people really don't care that they are looking at a small screen in order to access this content and these experiences? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think so. I mean, I think, you know, as, as, as was said before, the kind of second screen experience, you know, whether that's um, to support a, a, a TV ad um, or just the fact that, that people are happy to, you know, watch movies on, on tablets and smartphones. It's 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 I mean, that that's definitely the case. People are, you know, are much more flexible in the devices uh, that they use. Um, I think I think where it starts to get interesting is looking at not just consumption of that content but 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 looking at it from a marketing perspective we would you know our view would tend to to be how we can use the mobile device to kind of promote a particular you know games title or or, or, or a movie um, rather than actual uh, actually consumption um, and where it gets interesting um we've spoken a lot before about augmented reality um one of the stumbling blocks for augmented reality is to come up with great content to come up with content that people want to consume. Um, I, I've said for a while now that the, the sorts of companies that have great content are the entertainment companies. Again, whether it's gaming, whether it's movies, whether it's it's TV. So we're starting to see now companies saying we've got this content, we've got consumers, we want to reach them. How can we combine the two? How can we, you know, develop loyalty by by releasing and allowing people to unlock exclusive content? How can we promote, um, you know, our video content? How can we make it come to life in a point of sale environment? So there's lots of things that are happening using that existing content, using mobile devices, using technology like AR to engage users with that content and then hopefully go on to, you know, for people to buy the product or, or, or to download the game or, or the film title. Hmm. The, the interesting thing that you, you kind of touched on there was this notion that there is a very fine line here in terms of dedicated game content or something that has been created as a game or as a movie or as a TV series, so something that was designed to be entertainment consumption versus content strategy. And this is one of those things that, that, that I think is, is beginning to kind of blur the line a little bit in terms of this notion of marketing strategy as content strategy and defining content because it has a marketing purpose. And I wonder from, from perhaps Judith's perspective on, on this, because I know that you've got some, some pretty significant kind of digital clients like Virgin uh, that you work with, whether or not there is this, this emerging trend of actually commissioning by demand 
from a, a brand perspective, this content that, that actually would traditionally be commissioned by, by people like, like Colin, for example? I suppose there is that brands are becoming publishers. So they're looking for content and they need that content and they're pulling it from all over. So if we look at Virgin, for example, you can see that they're taking, for instance, um, their album covers and turning them into credit cards. Uh, you can see that they're taking content about businesses, for instance, their Virgin startup brand, and turning that into content. So it's a natural next step that an entertainment title would be turned into a movie or into something else that is as lucrative as content for that brand. Uh, and it's happening not just at the ends of people like Virgin, but uh, more, shall we say, traditional businesses are also looking at content to drive marketing. Uh, so it becomes a, a marketing imperative to find that engaging content that will bring people to a brand site instead of leaving them on somewhere like Facebook or Twitter. They want to bring them to the hub and get them engaging with everything. And if if turning a video game into a movie will bring people somewhere, then you can guarantee that there's a board out there who is debating how many times they can reuse Angry Birds in, an, in a movie before it becomes too much. If, if, if I could just jump in on that. Sorry, Tanya. Sure. Um, it's interesting from my perspective that I see, I see the same trend. I see a lot more brands getting involved and keen to get involved in games because they recognize the power. Um, but the, the mistake so many are making is that they, they think a game's just a game. They, they seem to sit around and decide, oh, we, we, we need a game. They commission someone. They don't think about what type of game. They don't think about what, what type of studio is going to be best suited to, to make that game. And they think the game is some magical marketing tool that is just suddenly going to bring millions of users who discover it virally or organically and bring them to their, their website or to their shelves in the, in the supermarket. Um, and, and unfortunately, most of those people that commission like that are going to fail. So the ones that do more and more are the ones that succeed because they, they commission a, a little bit smarter, thinking about what they want, how people are going to find the game in the first place, um, and, and how, you know what, what genre of game is going to appeal to the demographic they're targeting. I tend to absolutely agree with you, Colin, in as much as it feels a little bit like mobile, which is that, that no notion from a lot of corporates that, well, we have to have mobile, we need mobile, we should be mobile first, etc. and so forth. But then very oftentimes the, the first question that a, a, you know, a decent agency is going to ask is, why? Why do you need mobile? You know, what is the purpose of mobile in your mix? Because oftentimes it is just a rush to include everything. In the same way that you know having a game is, is you know it's about having a game. It's not necessarily adding value to the the franchise or adding value to the experience for the users. And that is that something that is a significant danger and and one that does allow for a lot of clutter, shall we say, in terms of what's being commissioned and what content is out there. There is a lot of stuff that's being put out there purely because somebody can do it. Doesn't necessarily mean they should do it. But uh, Judith, do do continue. Oh, I was going to say I absolutely agree. The internet is a wasteland of of like a an endless desert of abandoned microsites, which are the bane of my existence. And uh, it's simply because somebody thought it would be an awesome idea to do X, made a site for it, launched it, didn't do anything with it after that, and just let it die unceremoniously in the internet. And I think that that's an inappropriate strategy in any of my clients. If they came to us and wanted a strategy for mobile, wanted a strategy for gaming, anything like that, our first question would be, why? What's the benefit to the end user? What's the benefit to the person who's playing the game? Why, why do they want to play your game? Absolutely. But Colin, I, I have a question for you. And, and I suppose it's because... You you are working with a more traditional end of the market with Channel 4, but there are new types of, of publishers, new types of distribution networks emerging now as we move forward with streaming and, and cloud computing and all these other wonderful things that the internet of everything and the digital environment has brought to us. And we, we see people like Geek and Sundry who have massive, massive user uh, followings and significant amounts of viewers who are commissioning content based on 
collaboration with their audience, which is not something that traditionally somebody like, for example, Channel 4 may necessarily involve their audience in the, the commissioning process or the commissioning decisions. Do you think that this is a trend that will continue? Yes, and, and I guess from Channel 4's point of view, um, it, it's an unfortunate yes. But, I, I mean, I, I think there's two there's two things. One is just the, the, the speed at which things change, you, you know, in, in terms of technology and audience preferences um, and when you are and, and channel four isn't it's it's not that big a, an organization in the in the scheme of global broadcasters it's it's about as um nimble and dynamic as as you get as a as a broadcaster um but it still can't compete with with you know a handful of people um uh, reacting to you know day, days and weeks events um, so I think that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is that where traditional broadcasters kind of get hamstrung is because their market is a is a particular geographic territory. You know, so Channel Four broadcasts to to you know you know the UK and Ireland, um, and you know the numbers in terms of the gaming side of things, the the, the numbers of people that watch stuff in in that market is maybe five percent of the global audience. Whereas you stick something on YouTube or Twitch, you've got the whole planet as as an audience. So you're able to make viable content out of something that's much more niche because you've got the whole planet as an audience. Um, you know when the numbers simply don't stack up in the in the UK. So traditional broadcasters are a, a, a massive disadvantage. But I mean, tough. That's just the way th- things are, it's, and and I think it is going to continue that way things are going to get more dynamic more more niche people are going to expect things to cater to whatever their individual interests are and broadcasters like channel four have to find a way to react and do you think that there there is a, a kind of a roadmap for channel four to become more of a, a global broadcaster in that sense um i i, I mean in in channel four's case there's there's all sorts of government remits um it's experimenting a lot with short form content which I, I think is um it you know putting out feelings and feelers in in that regard um it's it's experimented with youtube um so yeah it's definitely trying to find a, find its its way and find a way to, to to compete in that market on the game side we now publish most of our games globally even though something like hollyoaks is is you know, predominantly just a UK brand, so yeah, we're we're you know th- there's limitations. We're not we're not suddenly going to get on the the radio spectrum in every country in the in in the world and and broadcast Hollyoaks globally, um, and and you know that's not what Channel Four wants to do. But it needs to find ways to compete, and it's yeah, it's it's experimenting in some interesting ways. Okay. So, Will, I know that that you guys work primarily with kind of more console games and you've had a little bit of experience with some mobile gaming as well. But I'm interested to understand from you what you think the kind of next generation of gaming will be, because we've heard um, recently that, uh, you know, there's been a lot of Hollywood support behind things like AR and and, um, the virtual reality company out of L.A. have recently managed to to nail down quite a few significant Hollywood names to support them. But do you think that this is something that you're you're hearing more demand for or being requested to develop more content for uh, augmented reality and virtual reality as it, it starts to emerge? Not, not at the moment, not at present. I mean, there's still a lot of, there's a lot of buzz around, you know, Oculus Rift and 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 the the the, the AR and the VR headsets that everything. But I think the the problem is <clears throat> because it's still effectively in development stage. Not one has actually come out really for the market to to really get their hands on and see what the what the consumer take up of that kind of content is. Everybody's sort of dipping their toe in the water and going, well, we should probably think about our content strategy for these kind of devices, but we don't really want to commit a significant portion of our marketing budget or our development budget to this kind of stuff yet because we really don't know how it's going to be taken up. Now, what you've got is you've got hundreds of thousands of people who are pretty much saying, yes, I'm going to buy an Oculus or a Morpheus or a Sulon Cortex or whatever it is or a HoloLens when they come out, but... These are kind of still bits of equipment that are – you play at them at, at, at consumer shows, and there's some games that are coming out. You know, we, we worked with the, the, the CCP guys um, on the Valkyrie, and, you know, it's 
we, we need this stuff to be actually out in the market to find out what the real uptake is before a lot of people in the market start going, yes, we're definitely going to put a lot of money behind this. Because, I mean, the development costs for games alone, I mean, if you look at Destiny, 500 million, it's a lot of money to then suddenly go, hey, let's try something with this new thing that hasn't actually come out in the market yet. It, it's a difficult sort of nail to put on. I mean, I'm sure it'll come when it becomes a lot more mainstream, but I think at the minute everybody's got it in the back of their mind, but they haven't really pushed forward with it yet. So from your perspective, is there any difference to your mind of development for something like a Sudon Cortex or a, an Oculus Rift versus development for gear? Not strictly, I suppose. It's still a, You still have to build an engine with a 360-degree experience. I mean, the only difficulty I would imagine is 3D spatial sound, <clears throat> you know, to really immerse you in that. Now, if you're talking about filmmaking content, Obviously, there's going to be a very, very different way of shooting a live-action interactive piece than there is shooting a 3D engine piece because with 3D engine, you, you, you already have to create that 3D environment. Um, with it, It's a different way. I suppose it's, like, it's almost like the same shift that filmmakers had when it moved from sort of 2D to 3D. There was a different way of thinking about stuff to actually make it work on the screen with the 3D lenses. This is almost a step further forward because not only are you making it 3D, you have to make it actually immersively feel 3d you have to be there because if you're not there and it doesn't feel like you're there then the experience is, is slightly lost on the individual that's actually viewing it very true so one of the things that we do on our show is we ask all of our guests what they think the next significant development is in terms of technology or software or trends or behaviors that you think will significantly impact your market and your industry in the next five to 10 years. So I would start with Colin on this one. What do you think is going to be the most significant thing that will impact what's going on specifically for commissioning of games? What do you think will be the, the thing that has impact for you? In general, I think that the, the, the couple of things that are, that, that are coming that are inevitable and, and we're seeing trends towards um, are are things like convenience, people wanting to play, you know, the the types of games that that suit them on devices um, that are convenient to them. Um, I think we're seeing more and more convergence. We've touched on that earlier, but you know, even even simple things like Clash of Clans, I, I like being able to play on my phone when I'm standing in a queue for my lunch just to check on my little village. Um, whereas at night I'll play it on my iPad um, when I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to, to do battle with someone. So that convenience of, of, of converging across different devices. And I think we're also going to see a, a, a sort of destigmatization of, of games in general. Um, even now when so many people are playing Candy Crush, there's still a stigma around games. There's a stigma around the word games. There's a stigma around people admitting that they play games. Um, there's all these stats about, you know, 52% of the, the UK population plays games, but 52% wouldn't freely admit it in the street. Um, but that will change. Um, but in terms of what I think is probably going to make the biggest difference to me, I would maybe say it changes around the discoverability of, of games and, and apps um, that I think there will come new technology before too long that does a much better job of, of picking which which new games I'm going to want to want rather than relying on the the, the couple of dozen games Apple feature each week. Um, I, I think we're not that far from a point where it's as if I've got a virtual friend that knows me well and goes, oh, you know what, there's, there's this new game. No one else is playing it, but... I just think it's up your street because you liked such and such a book or a film or a, a or a game before. Um, so I think it's personal discovery of new content. Okay, so so recommendations and alternative ways of getting recommendation. I'm going to leave you to bubble away on that one, and at the end of everybody else, I will ask you if you've changed your mind <laughs> because I asked you first. But James, do you want to give us your take on what you think is going to most significantly impact your industry? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, the, just 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 jumping back to the previous comments uh, about augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, 
it tends to they, they get lumped together for, for, for quite obvious reasons and, and people then start to talk about Oculus Rift um, and the virtual reality space. Um, and then even with hollow lens where you've got to kind of wear that device, um, we often tend to forget that a lot of the augmented reality experiences are, are, are possible on a mobile phone. So I think um, whilst the technology is, is there, what we're certainly seeing um, in the augmented reality space is, is distinct from virtual reality. Um, companies beginning to, to, to explore different ways to use the technology. It, it kind of builds on, on what I mentioned before. From a marketing perspective, there is content. The content's um, available. How can you um, get get potential customers to engage with it. The, the other point, we've talked a lot about people wanting games. You know, we need a game. We, we hear this all the time and, and we kind of say, well, with the budgets you've got, you're going to produce a really bad game, um, which is going to be worse than, you know, games that people have spent an awful lot of time and effort um, producing as, as their kind of day job. But that's not to say that we can't use elements of gamification um, to make experiences um, more engaging to have people coming back and returning. So I think it's looking at things like what's the content? How can we use elements of gamification? How can we create mobile moments? How can we create experiences that people are going to want to enjoy and that have a marketing message as well, promoting content? So, so for me, it's, it's, it's about actually beginning to use the technology that's available. It's looking at what's possible and building this into to new campaigns. And what I see is more and more concepts being put forward, not necessarily hitting the streets just yet, but we're starting to see people bring these different elements together. And hopefully once one or two campaigns come out that use mobile, that use augmented reality, hopefully then it will begin to, to kind of snowball from there. Okay, so really using what's out there in, in a more sensible and contextual way. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. Okay. And Judith, what's your take on the things that will most significantly impact your markets? I think that from my point of view, I become very cynical about what the future will bring because everything that has come before is touted as being new once again every year. So I can actually see some of my clients utilizing something like virtual reality to try to promote something like, I don't know, a networking tool or a, a, a new hub. And it just isn't right. What I would love to see revolutionize my industry is an approach that is more sensible by everybody. We've had budgets mentioned. We've had appropriateness of, of target market mentioned. If only if, if this could be the biggest impact on my industry, I would be in love with my industry again. And that is appropriate targeting for appropriate customers and not just randomly going off on tangents like I predict will happen in the future, where people grab onto the latest technology, utilize it inappropriately, and again, it becomes a wasteland of abandoned hopes and dreams of marketers. You make it sound so, so lovely, Judith. <laughs> I'm so in love with marketing. Can you not tell? <laughs> it, is, it is a bright future for us all. Um, okay, and, and Will, did, did I already do you? I don't think I did you yet, Will, did I? No, you didn't. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just really depressed now. So I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, just like, end the call and go home. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, no, I think, I think everybody's right. I think what, what will directly impact Fire Without Smoke as a business is, is most likely going to be virtual reality. And I absolutely agree with Judith that you're going to get a lot of clients going, hey, virtual reality, that sounds cool. Let's build something for that. And it's going to be completely wrong. I mean, it, it's very similar to the way a lot of brands are using social media at the minute. It's just chucking stuff on there and thinking of it as another media channel. Um, but I mean, I suppose because I work in the game space and the movie space, the crossover between those two within an actual experience like virtual reality is going to completely change. Because I know um, Colin said that a lot of people will not actually say they play games. Um, and he's absolutely right. They, you know, my wife will not admit that she actually plays Candy Crush on her phone, even though she's addicted to the damn thing. But when it comes to sort of virtual reality pretty much everybody will actually stand up and go, oh yeah, I tried it. It was awesome. It made me feel a little bit sick or it didn't make me feel a little bit sick. I think when you get that crossover between games and entertainment and you actually get 
to put it on your head and you actually get to feel it. Because I suppose a movie is a passive experience. You go to the cinema, it washes over for two hours. A game is a bit more of an interactive experience, but you still have that sort of relative safety Mm -hmm. feeling where you're playing Call of Duty and yes, the bullets are flying towards you, but to be honest, they're flying towards the TV screen. They're not actually flying towards you. When you put that virtual reality helmet on and the bullets are flying towards you, it's a completely different experience. You you know, you do find yourself trying to duck and you, you do feel a sense of immersion. I think once movies and entertainment start to do that crossover into that territory, I think I mean, it's not it's not there yet, and I don't even think it'll be there when they when all of the machines come out, sort of beginning of next year. I think it's going to take probably about a year after that. At that point, I think what you're going to have is emotionally immersive experiences that are going to change the landscape of both movies and games, especially in entertainment. But let me ask you this, well, and I, I mm-hmm. say this because I know you quite well. I'm, yes. gonna, I'm going to throw this at you as a curveball. Are you going to and... embarrass me live on? Uh, live on... <laughs> No, but I am going to suggest this. I'm going to suggest that you have bias. And, and and the reason I say this is because you work in the games industry. You you are a fan of games, as is everybody who works at Fire Without Smoke. And, and, ah, no, no, you wait, know. no, no, I have to dis- I, The Oculus actually makes me sick. Right. I, actually, I have really quite bad nausea. So, you know, I put it on and I, I've got it on for about five minutes. And I'm like, right, it's got to come off. Until they actually fix that, I'm not really going to be a, the kind of person who takes this up. But you're However, still thinking about it from a gamer's perspective. And what I was going to say is, yes. from a mainstream perspective, there is still this sentiment that VR is still a geeky, nerdy thing that you have to put on your head. And people are going to be put off by that. And until you get rid of the device, until you get rid of the headsets, and you find a, a frictionless way of introducing virtual reality or immersiveness it's not going to be something that people will universally accept. What, what would you say to no, that? No, I don't know. I disagree because, you know, we, 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 yes, we are basically a bunch of geeks that sit there with the damn thing on our head for hours on end. Obviously not me. It makes me sick. But everybody we've had in the office that we've put it on, from accountants to lawyers to whoever who's come in, have pretty much said, oh, my God, I've never seen anything like this. Um, and it is a, it's a strange it's a sort of strange sensation when you've got people who just don't play games and very rarely watch movies and you dump this weird bit of plastic on their head, all of a sudden they're like, oh, wow, this, is this what it's going to be like in the future? It's a very, very strange experience with those people who, you know, you say, what was the last movie you watched? And they go, Star Wars. And you're kind of like, okay, so you don't watch movies and you don't play games, but I put this thing on your head and you turn into a, you turn into a completely different person. You go back to your childhood and go, but I remember games when I used to play Pong on the TV, and that's pretty much the last game someone actually played. Okay, fair enough. I will take that as your, your final answer on the issue, Mr. Cole. Um, do, I, no, do I get the uh, who wants to be a millionaire sound? You passed. <laughs> yeah. Colin, I will let you have the very last say on this Digital Jam session. Are you sticking to your guns? Are, are, you, are you committed to your, your final answer? I, I think I am, and I'm, I'm going to take I'm going to take um, solace from the, the um, Judith's comments as well. I, I, I think we were sort of thinking along similar lines when she was talking about um, a, a, a appropriate targeting. Um, much as though she's fearful, it's not going to happen as much as she would like. Um, I, I think that is where the, the the smart money has to go, rather than just. Um, you, you know, paying money into the uh, into the wind and spreading it as as, as wide as possible. So, uh, I'm going to stick with that. Um, but I, I, I mean, if if it's worth just commenting on on um, the whole VR AR um, debacle, <laughs> dive in there, Colin, do it. Thought as well. <laughs> just, I, I mean, I'm I, I've been a fan of VR for longer than the most um you know going back to the you know playing with the the virtuality kits 20 years ago um but i think we're still much further away from something that's mass market than than most people think um i i think that um that reticence to put on that headset um it, it is much bigger than 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 people inside the games industry think and it's going to take something that 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 as you suggest, removes a lot of the hardware before it can become mainstream, mm-hmm. and that's it's probably AR rather than than VR. If I'm if I'm honest, mm-hmm. um, but one of the things that reminds me that it, it is just a matter of when, not if, when VR slash AR becomes massive, is 
the, the fact that there's you know there's now a trend on on YouTube of watching people's reactions to playing something in VR. Mm. Um, the fact that you can sit there and and watch someone hilariously jump out their skin when they're playing a horror game with a, a an Oculus headset on, the fact that that in itself is entertainment tells me that VR is going to be massive. It is just a matter of time. Interesting. Well, thank you very much for everybody's time today. Before I, I let you all go, what I will ask you to do is very, very quickly, let us know your Twitter handle, your URL, or whichever other way you would like for folk to be able to contact you. Starting with James. Yeah, um, our website is probably the best place to go and find out about what we're up to and try uh, some of our apps. Uh, that's www.kudan.eu and Kudan is spelled K-U-D-A-N. Thank you. And Judith? The best place to find London Girl Geek Dinners is at London GGD on Twitter. So London Girl Geek Dinners, just shorten the Girl Geek Dinners. Uh, that's probably the best place to find out about London Girl Geek Dinners. Of course, you can contact me directly by using my name on Twitter, Judith Lewis. Thank you. And Will? Uh, best way to get us is www.firewithoutsmoke.com. And Colin? Uh, on Twitter, I'm Scottish Colin. And to have a look at what we do, just search any of the app stores for Channel 4. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for your time today, guys. And remember, if you enjoy this content, to subscribe and review. Thank you. DigitalJamSessions.com